All right, well, welcome everybody. My name is Jeannie Kilby, Director of the Religious Studies Program, and I want to welcome you to uh, the annual uh, faculty lecture in Religious Studies. This has been a, uh, an effort that we started a couple of years ago. We're only seven years old. We're a new program. Um, we started this effort a few years ago and have had some very uh, excellent uh, um, lectures by Iraj Bashir, who's in our audience, a member of our steering committee, Iraj, and by Paul Rouser, who's in our audience, another member of our steering committee. Uh, and this year we're very honored to have Nabil Matar, another member of our steering committee, giving our uh, annual lecture. So, uh, it's, it's my privilege to be able to introduce Nabil to, to tell you a little bit about him. Uh, professor of English, uh, core faculty member in Religious Studies and member of the Steering Committee, as I mentioned, came to the Uni came to University of Minnesota in 2007, which was just as the Religious Studies program was, was starting up. Um, led a very distinguished career, uh, particularly has won a number of awards, including here in the College of Liberal Arts. He was awarded in 2001 as a, a College of the uh, Scholar of the College Award. Um, in 2012, he, he received the Building Bridges Award from the Association of Muslim Social Scientists in the UK. An interesting award that the year later went to Desmond Tutu. So very distinguished. Uh, award, um, uh, obviously. His work has been central to the religious studies program here at the University of Minnesota. Our program uh, is interdepartmental, so we bring together courses from various departments. As a result, we really are more about the contextual study of religion. Um, and Nabil's work has been central to helping build that contextualized idea. Uh, as I said, he arrived here in 2007, just as, it, as our program is starting to take shape. Um, his work has focused on interactions amongst religions and religious groups, particularly uh, amongst uh, Muslims and Christians. He's interested in how groups have constructed knowledge uh, of their knowledge of other religious groups, and how those knowledges have influenced uh, relationships amongst groups, and as I said, particularly sort of Anglo-Christians and um, uh, Islamic relations and interactions. Uh, he's uh, written several books um, uh, that uh, I'll briefly mention a few of the topics or the titles, uh, sort of starting 1998 with uh, Islam in Britain, 1558 to 1685, followed up with Turks, Turks, Moors, and Englishmen in the Age of Discovery in 2000. That followed within the lands of the Christians, Arabic travel writing in the 17th century in 2000. Britain and Barbary, Europe through the eyes of Arabs, Britain and the Islamic world through the eyes of the beholder. Lots of publications as on looking at how groups are looking at each other, how they're learning about and talking about each other. Most recently then, just came out Henry <coughs> Stubb in the beginnings of Islam. The original progress of Mohammedanism uh, from Colombia came out last year. And one of my favorite books, long time ago, the Islam for Beginners book, which is a charming, a charming uh, little, uh, little gift book for a lot of people. Uh, so with that, we have a sense of what uh, Nabil is working on or has worked on, and I'm eager to hear this uh, new talk on uh, John Locke, and I have forgotten your title, John, John Locke, Locke and, Islam. and Islam, very good. Okay. I give you Nabil Matar. Okay, thank you so much, Jean. <laughs> thank you so much, Jean, it was gracious, and thank you, members of the steering committee, for being here, and my students, I thought you got tired of me, so <laughs> thank you for being here, and all the other visitors and attendants, thank you. Uh, I think the shutters have been closed not because we're showing a film or because we don't want to see the snow out there, <laughs> but uh, it's out there. All right. The Elizabethan. No, nope. just turning those off. No, I need that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Do you, it does it have a... Yeah, we're having lighting issues. That's okay. Oh, okay. That's okay. Is, that, is that good? Yeah, that's fine. Right. Okay. The Elizabethan settlement identified religious conformity with political allegiance. Is this one? Okay. Not unlike the Cuius Regio, Uius Religio of the 1555 Peace of Augsburg in the Holy Roman Empire, from 1559 on, subjects in England had to subscribe to the two acts of supremacy and uniformity. And I have a flyer which and wrote down all this stuff I hope will be useful. The first declaring the monarch as head of the state, and the second determining worship under the monarch as head of the church. In such an Anglican monarchy, there could be no legal space for the non-Anglican subject, let alone the non-Christian. The few Maranos, Jews forcibly converted to Christianity, lived as Portuguese immigrants, at the same time that Protestant, uh, Dutch, and Walloon traders from the continent congregated in strangers churches, that was their official name, strangers churches, and while they were allowed to worship in their own languages, they remained outsiders to the English Anglican polity. After the restoration of Charles II in 1660, the old religious order was restored with a vengeance, as parliamentary act curtailed the parliamentary acts, curtailed the freedom and livelihood of dissenters. And the centers were the non-Anglicans, basically Quakers, Presbyterians, uh, Baptists, everybody who was not an Anglican was the, the center. The Cooperation Act, and I've got them all listed for you in 1661, the Act of Uniformity, 1662, and that resulted in the great ejection of around 2,000 uh, ministers, Presbyterian ministers, and non-Anglican from the church. The Conventicle Act, the Five Mile Act, and the Second Conventicle Act in 1670. In the shadow of this great persecution, as one theologian called it, clergy and laymen struggled to redefine the relationship between the Anglican monarchy and the dissenters. Whether there was a move towards an open society, as John Coffey suggests, is not clear, since whatever toleration or comprehension was discussed was nearly always in regard to Christian denominations and not to religious groups outside Christianity. <coughs> Nonetheless, in 1655, Oliver Cromwell admitted some Jews to England, raising millenarian expectations among those eager to convert them. At the same time, British trade in the Islamic Mediterranean was flourishing, with large maritime and commercial investments by the East Levant Company. Various Ottoman and Moroccan ambassadors and a few charlatans visited England, and there were treaties with the North African regencies, stipulating that as Englishmen could practice their Christianity freely, in Tripoli or Algiers, so could Muslims practice Islam in Portsmouth or London. Furthermore, publications about the Ottoman polity by both visitors and chroniclers describe the secure place determined by Quranic law for Christians and Jews to live, work, and worship. In the light of these developments, the question came to the fore whether or not Muslims, and indeed Jews, could be tolerated in the Anglican polity. For until 1685 and the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, France was the only country in Western Europe to have constitutionally guaranteed toleration of religious minorities. Could non-Christians have legal rights in England and not just the protection of the ruler, be that Cromwell or the Stuart monarch? Two writers furnished original and different answers to the question. Henry Stout and John Locke. The two men were exact contemporaries. Both were born in 1632, studied at Westminster School, matriculated at Christ Church, Oxford, and were pupils of the Orientalist Edward Pocock. In 1659, Stubb published a treatise called An Essay in Defense of the Good Old Cause, a treatise in which he argued for the toleration of Quakers and Catholics. Locke liked it although he disagreed over the toleration of Catholics. And he wrote to Stubb, praising him for showing how, quote, men of different professions may quietly unite under the same government and unanimously carry the same civil interest and hand in hand march to the same end of peace and mutual society, though they take different ways to heaven, end of quote. He signed off to Stubb as your admirer. 
Locke first mentioned Muslims after reading an anonymous treatise by Edward Bagshaw, also of Westminster School and also of Christ Church, entitled The Great Question Concerning Things Indifferent in Religious Worship. An independent, meaning he was outside the Presbyterian fold, obviously not an Anglican, an independent, Bagshaw hoped that the restored king, Charles II, would confirm the toleration he had promised in the Declaration of Breda for April 1660. Bagshaw feared that toleration would extend to the Presbyterians, who would be enticed into the Anglican establishment, not, if not the communion, and leave out smaller groups like his. And so he stated at the outset of the treatise that just as the magistrate did not force the Muslims or the Jews to forsake their religion, so should he not force dissenters away from their practices and beliefs. In his reply to Bagshaw in this December 1660, in the title of the treatise, whether the civil magistrate may lawfully impose and determine the use of indifferent things in reference to religious worship, Locke accepted the political logic in regard to non-Christian subjects. He believed that no man could, quote, be required to believe what was not presented to him to believe, end of quote. But while the magistrate had, the authority, had no authority to determine religion, Locke thought that he did have authority in what he called indifferent things, those rites and ceremonies that were neither part of natural law nor of divine revelation. Logically, therefore, it would not be unlawful for the magistrate, quote, to prescribe either time or place or habit to a Mohammedan for his worship, if his Al-Quran had left them undeterred, end of quote. Locke was trying to bring Islamic and dissenter practices under one authority in matters he believed to be theologically indifferent. The reference to time and place clearly points to worship in an Anglican church and not in a conventicle whose members determined when and where they wanted to worship. The reference to habit is to the surplus which the Anglican priest wore and which the nonconformists, the dissenters, basically uh, decried as popish, as Catholic. That Locke should compare these indifferent matters with the Mohammedan code reveals his limited knowledge of Muslim worship. While the Quran does not restrict place except in direction to Mecca, the Sunnah, the secondary but equally important source of law in Islam, enjoins worship with the community in the mosque, at least on Friday. While the Quran does not establish a firm schedule of worship, what he mentioned as time, the Sunnah does. Neither the Quran nor the Sunnah mentions a dress code habit. Although the Quran prescribes ablution, and the Sunnah prescribes prostration. Locke equated the authority of the Bible in Christian worship with the authority of the Quran in Muslim worship. Either he was being a purist, arguing for the sole authority of the Quran in the manner that Protestants argued for sola scriptura without the accretions of Catholic traditions, or he was ignorant of the place of the Sunnah in Islamic theology. In either case, he was consistent in his argument. The magistrate did not control religion, only indifferent practices. In 1667, Locke changed his views in favor of toleration of the dissenters. In his essay on toleration, 1667, he used Bagshaw's exact premises to defend the dissenters and to separate, as one critic has said, to separate religious form from civil performance. End of quote. Since non-Christians, in this case Locke referred to the Jews, were tolerated in England, so should the dissenters be. As far as he was concerned, and in the light of the various letters of indemnization that some Jews were granted by King Charles II, the status of Jews was not problematic. Locke did not publish his essay, and as he was becoming active in London political and colonial life in the early 1670s, his old correspondent, Henry Stubb, wrote his treatise, The Original and Progress of Mohammedanism. Times in England were turbulent, especially after King Charles II had issued his Declaration of, Independence, of Indulgence in March 1672, granting toleration to dissenters and Catholics, bringing on him the disaffection of the Anglican establishment. Stubb published a lengthy treatise in support of his king, 
the title is The Justification of the Present War Against the United Netherlands, wherein the declaration of His Majesty is vindicated, in which he showed the parallels between King Charles II and Emperors Constantine and Theodosius, and particularly how all three rulers had the authority and the right to determine religion in the state. However, after being forced by the opposition to break the great seal of the indulgence a year later, Charles gave up on toleration and began to gravitate toward the Anglican party created by the Earl of Danby, which necessarily involved a strict enforcement of uniformity in religion and granted no toleration either for Roman Catholics or for Protestant dissenters. In the action, Stubb turned to the Islamic model of the polity. And in his treatise, The Original Progress of Mohammedanism, he showed how Muhammad, how Muhammad, combining religion with political power, prepared the ground for an Islamic empire that allowed for coexistence with Christians and Jews. Uniquely among European writers, this debating toleration, Stubb invoked what he, the, term he, the phrase he used, the great prophet Muhammad, who had consolidated the power of the state without undermining religious authority, a religious plurality. Having read the Old and New Testaments in the light of the higher criticism uh, of scholars such as Isaac Causeborn, Claude Salmatius, Gerard Vosius, and others, Stubb argued that the post-Constantinian doctrines of the Christian Church had not stemmed from the teachings of the Gospels, but from imperial decrees. Epiphanius, whose Panarian Stubb often mentioned, showed how rife with heresy the Jewish and Christian communities were in the centuries before Muhammad. To make toleration of Muslims possible, Stubb realized that Christians would have to make theological adjustments. Only when the two theologies and their scriptures were drawn together would political destabilization and civil war, engendered by difference in denomination and religion, come to an end. As Bishop Samuel Parker, an Anglican, wrote in his 1670, A Discourse of Ecclesiastical Polity, it's in the quotation there, how vain is it to expect peace and settlement in a commonwealth where their religion keeps men in a state of war, where zeal is armed against zeal and conscience encounters conscience. For Parker, only the authority of the Anglican monarch could ensure religious submission and subsequent peace. For an alternative, Stubb turned to Islamic history. Aware that Christians had lived in the Muslim dominions as far back as the beginnings of Islam, Stubb explained Islam's toleration of Christians by reference to Muhammad's admiration of Jesus, or as he called him throughout his treatise, Isa, the Quranic name. Muhammad, wrote Stubb, and it's in the flyer, was undoubtedly a great admirer of Isa as a prophet or apostle of God, and of this he makes so great and frequent declarations, and that Asa was his predecessor and taught the same doctrine, that it is but justice to style him a Christian. End of quote. Indeed, on two occasions in treatise, Stubb referred to Muhammad as the great prophet, exactly the same phrase used about Jesus in the King James translation of Luke's Gospel. Having shown Islamic acceptance of Jesus in a non-Trinitarian way, of course, Stubb turned to examine the scriptural canon, which was coming under scholarly scrutiny from the higher critics of the Bible. He had learned from the work of John Gregory, again, he's on the list, another student of Pocock's, also at Christ Church, and there was a nucleus of tremendous energy there, and an Arabist, that there were, for instance, early Arabic sources of Christian text. As Gregory says, the Mohammedans have another Lord's Prayer, called by them the prayer of Jesu, the son of Mary. End of quote. This prayer, he explained, appeared in the Gospel of the Nazarites, or that secundum he prays, as it used to be called. End of quote. Stubb concluded that the Arabic texts belong in a history of an alternative Christian canon, where there are other texts in other languages that also belong to the canon but had been ignored or suppressed. The answer came in a text that bridged the Quranic view of the human Christ with the human divine view of Christian doctrine. These are Stubb's words at the very end of the first surviving manuscript of the treatise, and it's again on your sheet. 
Lastly, whereas it said in the Gospel, except I go hence, the Comforter shall not come, this they interpret about Muhammad, and it is one of the names of Muhammad among the Saracens, that is the Comforter. They also say that Christians have corrupted their Gospels and expunged many passages which gave credit to Muhammad, and that a Christian priest showed them in a true copy to that purpose, and said there was another unsophisticated, I am unsophisticated gospel preserved in Paris. Stubb does not mention the gospel by name. So to what was he alluding? The association between the paraclete of John, you know, John 14, 16, and its prophetic application to Muhammad could be found in the 8th century surah, uh, sirah, uh, or biography of Ibn Hisham, and the work of numerous other Muslim exegetes, and these were known to Pocock and other European scholars. Stubb, however, knows not just a reference to Muhammad as the paraclete, but of a gospel. And the only gospel which emphasizes the association between Muhammad and the paraclete was the gospel of Barnabas. Only the vero evangelio di Jesu, as the Italian title reads, makes that association its theological foundation. By invoking the Gospel of Barnabas, Stubb applied the strategy that the Andalusian authors in Spain had used at the end of the 16th century. In their fear of expulsion from their homeland, they forged Arabic writings and claimed that they had been revealed in the first century AD and then, quote unquote, discovered in the area that came to be known as the Sacromonte in Granada, Spain. These were, as they came to be known, the lead books consisting of a number of Gospels in which Mary and Peter describe the Christ without incarnation. Although not among the lead books, the Gospel of Barnabas was another forgery, which presented the Quranic Christ of miracles and power without incarnation or crucifixion, who spoke openly of the advent of Muhammad. The authors of these books, of these works, hoped that by allowing, by showing Muslim veneration to Mary and Jesus, and by showing that Muhammad had been prophesied by Jesus, they would create an accommodation that would protect them from expulsion. It did not. And between 1609 and 1614, all the Andalusians, derisively called Moriscos, were violently driven out. With the history of the expulsion of the Andalusians in mind, Stubb cast his eye on the Christian population in the Ottoman polity, noting a striking contrast. While Muslims had been expelled from the Christian dominions, the Greeks enjoyed more freedom under Ottoman rulers than they had under previous Byzantine potentates. And this is a quotation, yet it's observed by Joseph Scaliger, and it's an assured truth that the vulgar Greeks live in a better condition under the Turk at present than they did under their own emperors, when there were perpetual murders practiced on their princes and tyranny on their people but they are now secure from injury if they pay their taxes, and it's more the interest of the princes and nobles than of the people at present, which keeps all Europe from submitting to the Turks. Such toleration had been possible because of Islam's recognition of Jesus. By making a similar place for Muhammad in the religious history of monotheism, Stubb defined the premises for tolerating Muslims in the Christian polity. Since veneration of Jesus inspired the Quranic protection of Christians in the Islamic polity, then some form of veneration of Muhammad should open the door for protection of Muslims in the Christian polity. Whether Stubb would have followed up on this theological approach with a political formulation cannot be determined. He died soon after finishing, but not publishing, his treatise. No other writer before Stubb had furnished as detailed a history of Islam and its toleration as his treatise had. Stubb was the first European writer to show how fundamental religious plurality had been in Islam's foundational theology, and how much non-Muslims, Jews and Christians alike, had been accommodated in the peace treaties between the early Arab Muslim armies and the peoples of the Byzantine Empire. Like Stubb, Locke had become interested in Islam under the guidance of Edward Pocock. While tutoring Pocock's son, Locke acquired numerous works about Islam, ranging from the French 1647 translation of the Quran to Pocock's own 1663 translation of Abu Faraj's 
Chronicles, and numerous other books about the East, including the Latin translation of Hay ibn Yaqdan by the younger Pocock. He was actually tutoring his son, and that's the one who translated it. And so, when sometimes in the mid-1680s, Locke began working on his famous Epistola de Tolerancia, he brought in Muslims in a manner that he had not done in his earlier writings. Although he included them with the non-Christian Jews and pagans, he had to approach them differently, given the complexity of their international status. Locke wrote Epistola soon after the accession of the Catholic James II to the throne in 1685. Two years later, King James issued the Act of Indulgence, which gave freedom to subjects, quote, to meet and serve God after their own manner, as long as they did not alienate the hearts of our people from us or our government, end of quote. As, two, as Houston and Pincus, two critics men, have observed, the act, quote, broke the equation of dissent with disloyalty. So this affected was the Anglican establishment with the act that one Anglican writer criticized the king in 1688, saying that the act had opened the door for the toleration of Muslims, the same toleration for which Locke, uh, Locke argued in his yet unpublished epistola. He writes it in 1685-86, publishes it, however, in 1689. As his treatise shows, Locke was aware that large Christian populations lived in the Islamic world, chiefly in the Ottoman East. Henry Blunt, a traveler, included in his travelogue of 1634 a whole section on the varieties of Christian communities in the Sultan's dominions, as did Paul Rico in his very popular history of the Ottoman Empire of 1668, of which, and by the way, Locke had copies of both books in his library. Many writers, especially dissenters, described such toleration in glowing terms, including the Quaker William Penn, whose works uh, Locke also owned. In Epistola, Locke began the argument for the legalization of the status of Muslims, Jews, and pagans in Britain. Began because it was an argument that would gradually develop and reach its conclusion a few years later, in 1692. That he brought the pagans into the picture is significant. They had not been mentioned anywhere in his previous writings for or against toleration, but in 1669, Locke had written the constitution of the new colony of Carolina and had argued for accommodating them, the pagans, suggesting that heathen, it's his word, heathen as they were, they believed in some kind of God. He linked them with the Jews and the dissenters in the hope of converting them all to Anglican Christianity. Locke also included Muslims in the toleration discussion. Although they were unique, among the three groups. Only among Muslims did large numbers of Christians live, and not the other way around, as in the case of Jews and pagans. And so Locke called for the toleration of Muslims as an act of reciprocity. Since Muslims tolerate Christians in the Islamic world, so should Christians tolerate Muslims, uh, should, should, should tolerate Muslims. Non-toleration of Muslims in Christian polities, he warned, could have serious ramifications on the Christians in Muslim lands. What if to a pagan or a Mohammedan prince, he said, the Christian religion seems false and offensive to God? May not Christians too be extirpated for the same reason and in the same manner? End of quote. As another author put it in the same year, 1689, neither Jews nor Mohammedans in the dominions of Christian princes ought to be compelled to hear reasons for convincing and persuading them to embrace Christianity because Christians would not like to be so treated by them." End of quote. And so, as a logical conclusion to his argument in support of toleration of dissenters, and in the last pages of his epistola, Locke openly urged the acceptance of pagan, Mohammedan, and Jew. All must be included in the Commonwealth, and along with Socinians, Lutherans, and others, allowed, quote, assemblies, solemn meetings, celebrations of feast days, sermons, and public worship." End of quote. The logic of his conclusion infuriated an Oxford Dunn by the name of Jonas Prost, who promptly wrote a rebuttal, attacking Locke's toleration, as he said, of the different professions of the Christian religion. 
More objectionable to prose, however, was Locke's concluding remarks in regard to non-Christians. And so he, Prost, opened his treatise uh, of the title, Argument of the Letter Concerning Toleration, briefly considered and answered. Briefly is around 150 pages, but that's brief. By showing that Locke wanted to extend toleration to everyone who held, quote, no opinions contrary to civil society, and who concurred on the duty of tolerating all men in matters of mere religion, end of quote. Although the main thrust of his argument was to reject toleration of dissenters, in his first two pages, Prost attacked Locke's call for toleration of non-Christians. Locke, he claimed, had put forward a dangerous view. Quote, that neither pagan, nor Mohammedan, nor Jew ought to be excluded from the civil rights of the commonwealth. End of quote. The statement shows that Prost had read William Popple's English translation of Locke's Epistola, where the phrases jura civilia and jus civile had been rendered as civil rights. Although Locke had not used the phrase in the context of non-Christians, it was Prost who applied it, who applied it to the Muslim and others, he promptly adopted it, confirming, in his words now, the civil rights of the commonwealth for pagan, Mohammedan, or Jew. End of but instead of continuing the discussion of rights, Locke turned to a commonly invoked argument <coughs> that toleration is the best means to a conversionary end, and admitting non-Christians to live in the Christian polity of England would be conducive to their conversion. This was the same argument that he had used in regard to pagans and Jews in the Carolina Constitution. But now he pushed the argument further. Toleration not only allowed non-Christians living in our midst to convert, it also allowed us to preach the doctrines of the Church of England in any, as he said, Mohammedan or pagan country. Finding himself out-argued, Prost decided on blunt confrontation. Granted the imprimatur to publish his second letter concerning toleration, 1691, Prost stated that the author of Epistola, he knew it was Locke, but he never mentioned his name, and Locke had been anonymous in the publication, uh, that the author of Epistola was asking for nothing less than the indemnization of Muslims, using the term for the first time in the exchange, indemnizant. Significantly, Prost did not use the term naturalized, as naturalization was granted through an act of parliament, while indemnization was by letter patent from the monarch. Still, Prost realized that bringing to the debate the prospect of Muslim and other non-Christian indemnization would position law against the English writers who were criticizing the indemnization and naturalization of foreigners. And often these two terms were joined together. As in the case of the phrase civil rights, so in the case of indemnization. Locke latched onto it as a logical conclusion to his argument. Inadvertently, Prost forced Locke to move the discussion beyond the social parameters of toleration to the legal framework of citizenship. As in the case of civil rights, Prost was pushing Locke in directions which the latter had not explicitly articulated, but which he could not reject if he was to maintain logical consistency. In opposing the indemnization of non-Christians, Prost did not wade into the discussion about economic advantages or disadvantages. These were widely kind of debated issues. He was an ordained dun, and from inside the walls of Oxford University, more concerned about God than mammon. He argued, if Jews, Muslims, and Christians, uh, sorry, if Jews, Muslims, and pagans were indenizant, they would seduce Protestants to their religions rather than the other way around, as Locke had argued. Englishmen would desert Christianity without having to fear the consequences of forfeiting their civil rights as subjects. Pros feared that granting the security of indemnization to non-Christians uh, non would encourage apostasy in England. After all, quote, even God's own peculiar people received that mortal infection, notwithstanding all that he did to keep them from it. End of course. Detecting inconsistency, Locke wrote his third letter, finishing on 20 June 1692, interestingly invoking Islam. 
To learn some moderation, he advised Prost, look at Muslims, even pagans, how they treat outsiders. Locke continued, quote, if Jews, Muslims, uh, if Jews, Mohammedans, and pagans were to be denied civil rights in the Commonwealth, because they could seduce followers of the national church, the Anglican church, then should, so should Socinians, Papists, Anabaptists, Quakers, Presbyterians, who pose more of a danger than the non-Christians, because those groups, because danger is most from that religion which comes nearest to, to it and most resembles it, end of quote. There was less danger in non-Christians, such as Jews and Muslims, simply because they were alien in their customs and social habits. They were, as Locke, for to Locke, they were foreign and therefore would remain unintegrated in the social fabric, abiding without, as he said, the advantage of truth or interest to prevail by. English non-Anglicans were more dangerous than them because they were part of the historical culture of England. And since these non-Anglicans were, quote, admitted to the rights of the Commonwealth, end of quote, then there was no logical argument that Prost could make to prevent, again, quote, Jews, pagans, and Mohammedans from enjoying the same rights. And then he asks, and this is uh, on the sheet, why, asked Law, this common pravity of human nature should make Judaism, Mohammedanism, or paganism more catching than any sort of non-conformity, which hinders men from embracing the true religion, so that Jews, Mohammedans, and pagans must, for fear of infecting others, be shut out from the commonwealth where others are not. End of quote. Unlike Prost, Locke did not fear that Christians in England would be, as he said, infected by the disease of the two other monotheisms. There was no historical proof that when Christians met members of, other, of the other two religions on equal terms, as he put it, that they would lose. Christians could not be defeated. Locke kept the discussion within the religious sphere, and like Prost, did not bring in economic or commercial factors in regard to the advantages of indemnization. He wanted to defeat Prost on his own grounds. But he was aware at the same time of the strength of the national security argument against naturalization or indemnization. As one author warned, naturalized foreigners never forgot their allegiances and could prove, quote, dangerous to the government. End of quote. Danger to the polity was sufficient reason not only to deny indemnization and naturalization, but toleration too. That is why Locke denied toleration to three communities in England. Catholics, whom he feared were in obedience to an infallible foreign power, the Pope. Atheists, because they feared no accountability. And enthusiasts, that's the term he uses, enthusiasts kind of the fringe millenarians, because they threatened law, law and order. But writing just a few years after the Vienna defeat, the defeat of the Ottoman armies at the gates of the Vienna, uh, Locke could not have been oblivious to Ottoman military might. In March 1684, under half a year after the Ottoman defeat and the multitude of London ballads that celebrated the defeat, and the year or so before beginning work on his epistola, he wrote to a friend of his, Edward Clark, hoping that Christian Europe would unite against the Ottoman enemy. In his discussion of indemnization, however, Locke did not allude to the Ottoman danger. After all, Paul Rico had assured Britons in the last pages of his oft-published The Present State of the Ottoman Empire that the Ottomans were too weak to venture against England. But while there was no military danger in Muslims, Rico had warned that the danger lay in the alleged authority of the Mufti of Constantinople over them. And this is the quotation we have. The Mufti is the principal head of the Mohammedan religion, or oracle of all doubtful questions in the law, and, in a person, and is a person of great esteem and reverence amongst the Turks. His election is solely in the Grand Senior, who chooses a man to that office always famous for his learning in the law and eminent for his virtues and strictness of life. His authority is so great amongst them that when he passes judgment or determination in any point, 
the Grand Signor himself will in no wise contradict or oppose it. Riku's description of the power of the Mufti was inaccurate. Although during the reign of Murad IV, between 1623 and 1640, there had been an earnest policy of converting minorities. After reading the passage in Rico, Locke felt the need to take account of the Mufti factor and stated that whatever rights Muslims were to be given in England, including indemnization, should be conditional on the Muslims' renunciation of the authority of the Mufti of Constantinople, quote, who himself is entirely obedient to the Ottoman Emperor, end of quote. Locke confirmed the viability of Muslims as subjects, but he wanted to make sure that they would not form a fifth column of traitors in the manner that Henry VIII had made treasonous the defense of papal supremacy, thereby equating patriotism with religious obedience. Once Muslims denied their allegiance to the Mufti, they could be safely indemnified. In urging Muslims to renounce their non-existence allegiance to the Mufti, Locke deviated from his, logic, from his usual logical consistency. Christians in the Ottoman Empire were not viewed by the authorities as subversive and were not forced to deny their allegiance to the Pope, at least in the case of the Catholics, even though the Pope was relentlessly sending missionaries and trying to undermine the faith of the subjects of the Sultan. At the same time, Locke did not criticize English missionary publications which were being sent to the Ottoman Levant to gain converts to Anglican Protestantism. These publications included prayers for the British monarchs, not the Ottoman sultans. While Muslims in England were to forego allegiance to the Mufti, Ottoman converts to the Church of England were told to pray in Arabic and in Aleppo or Istanbul or anywhere else for the safety of Sultan Carlos, Charles II. In the translation prepared by Pocock of the Book of Common Prayer, the book that is used by the Anglican Church, it was translated in 1670 uh, into Arabic, the Muslim or Orthodox Christian or Jew or whoever converts, the convert to Anglican Protestantism was to repeat the following invocation. You have that there. Listen to us, Lord, and preserve and bless our gracious queen and the king's brother and the rest of the sultan's household. The sultan being. Carlos. By the time he finished the third letter on toleration, Locke had confuted the arguments of Prost and demonstrated the legality of Muslims, Jews, and pagans becoming subjects of the crown. In the case of Muslims, however, Locke's call for indemnization remained unrealized. There is no record that Muslims were ever indemnized or naturalized in the Anglican polity, unless they were willing to convert to Christianity. Actually, in the polarized climate of post-1688 Britain, there was vociferous opposition even to the prospect of naturalizing foreign Protestants, as the defeat of the 1708 Act shows. And in 1754, popular anger forced the British Parliament to repeal the Jewish Naturalization Act, which had been passed a year earlier to naturalize the Jews of England. <coughs> no similar prospects for naturalizing Muslims were proposed. Using two different approaches, Henry Stubb and John Locke challenged England's theological and political status quo in regard to Muslims. Uniquely in the early modern debates about toleration, Stubb appeared to the historical appeal to the historical model of the Islamic polity while Locke included in his defense of the toleration of dissenters the call for the indemnization of Muslims, Jews, and pagans. Locke formulated the legal basis for determining the status of the subject in the Anglican monarchy. Although the epistola, as one critic has said, was neither as original nor as liberal as defenses of toleration penned by other European writers who had preceded Locke, end of quote, it was quite revolutionary in moving the debate beyond its traditional intra-Christian parameters to the non-Christian, and to do so not as a result of moral conscientiousness, but of logic. 
having rescued the state from the church, as one critic put it, Locke was able to argue for an early modern plurality in the state. His inclusion of non-Christians in the Christian polity reveals a conceptualization of the state that is wide enough for those who deny the religion and not just the denomination, because the Huguenots were Christian but Protestant, so not just the denomination but the religion of the monarch, but, to, but do not threaten state security. His observations on Muslims and Jews and pagans constitute the first argument in European political theory for granting the non-Christian civil rights by means of indemnization. It's true that Locke conceived of toleration in a steward state that was, as one historian said, like a limited liability company, the ring holder in a laissez-faire business community. But it was the first company in European political history that did not, in principle, discriminate against its members on the basis of Islamic or Jewish or pagan religion. And so, after 30 years of reflecting on toleration and moving from opposition to legal approbation, Locke concluded that there was no reason why Muslims, Jews, and pagans should live in Christian polities in England and its colonies, but be denied indemnization. As he said, and that's the last quotation, live amongst you then, Jews, Mohammedans, and pagans may, but in denizen they may not be, he asked in the sister letter. It was simply illogical, he conceded. It was also illegal. I mean, he had a copy of it, uh, yeah. but there have been English translations. This had sold out earlier, but there weren't that many. But you're right. I mean, he did read it. Go ahead. And the other thing is that I think it would be important to mention that, and you did mention the friendship between the Locke and the Scott. Uh, and part of this friendship uh, was influenced in Locke, as you mentioned. But it's important, I think, also to mention that Scott converted to uh, Islam. And when that's interesting. I don't know that. I mean, I've just worked on stuff for five years. So well, where do you find that, that? I mean, I don't know. Well, we could check this out, but that's my impression. Uh, Stubb is, is buried in, in a cathedral. That's what I've read. Yeah. If he had converted, he would not have been buried in a cathedral. Okay, I'm, I'm glad to know that. Yeah, I mean, he's buried in Bristol. I mean, they don't have, the poor guy doesn't have a marker, but he's buried there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then my real question, sure. and I hope that you will also tell me that. I had uh, always thought that Locke himself was uh, not a Trinitarian, but was a Unitarian, and that therefore he was uh, interested maybe in winning over Muslims and so on. I mean, he at least mentioned this, but not to Trinitarianism, to Anglicanism insofar only as it was Socinian. And Anglicanism was not really Socinian that much, so as a part of Locke wanted to uh, promote Christianity but he didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. He was willing to call him Messiah, but not anything else, not divine in the sense of the second of the Trinity. And he was Unitarian. And therefore, Locke, that was part of his tolerance because his own view didn't fit in in the conformity with the Trinitarianism that was then. Uh, you're, you're quite right. I mean, he was not Trinitarian. And in his treatise, I mean, he makes that very clear in the treatise on the reasonableness of Christianity, which he published in 1695. I mean, it's, you know, you read it and there's barely a mention of Jesus uh, in that respect. So you're right. Yeah. He, I mean, in, in terms of his formal uh, allegiance, he was an Anglican. Uh, but what did that mean? How did he express that? Is, is not important or was not important for him. Uh, but you're quite right, absolutely, in terms of his theology. He was not kind of a Trinitarian in the kind of Christian tradition itself. 
Yeah. And this is a comes from a point of ignorance, but uh, it always seemed to me that um, his letter on toleration, the the epistola, is somewhat better known than this third text. Yeah. Um, I is it, what, what, and what's the exact title of the third, the 1692 text? He, it's basically a third letter concerning toleration in response to Prost's letter. So, so that's what, what I'm mean. what I'm curious about is. Was that as influential on other people's thought? Uh, would Thomas Jefferson have been aware of the third letter as well as the first? I, was saying, I, never thought of that. I don't know. Uh, so, I mean, it was published, so it was available. Uh, and then he actually started the fourth letter, but he never finished that. I think got that, I don't think. Uh, but, uh, so I don't know in terms of the impact on Jefferson. It was known, but usually, I mean, yeah, the first letter is much more succinct. These become long-winded, I and mean, the second and third letters are extremely long. Uh, so, you know, when you get, and they don't really develop much except, as I say, in these areas, particularly in the areas of Islam. I mean, that's where I think he was being pushed by Prost, and so he ends up using this term, which he doesn't use at least in the epistola. Uh, so I think, you know, somebody who's interested in that angle would go, go ahead and read them and try to see what they say. But in terms of the principle of toleration, it doesn't change. Actually, even from the 1667 treatise, I mean, you know, he will maintain that principle throughout from that point. But, uh, you know, it, it was available. I don't know how widely read it was. Yeah? Hi. Um, so, you know, in the balance. Yeah, thanks for the shout out, uh -huh. sort of. Um, you mentioned, and I was wondering if you would eventually, you mentioned um, that the Ottomans did not manage to take Vienna. That just sort of like was sort of the beginning of the end of their military might, at least as England was interpreting it. I'm wondering how different you think the conversation around toleration in the early 90s would have changed if they had managed to take it and had pushed farther into Europe. Because you had mentioned specifically that they could use, that Locke at least could use the justification while they aren't actually a threat to us militarily. Uh, that's why I think, you know, the discussion on Muslims is kind of distinct from the pagans and uh, the Jews because there is always a threat. I doubt, I mean, I don't know, I doubt that he would be able to fit them in because then he would have viewed Muslims in the same kind of danger as he would have viewed Catholics, as he would have viewed atheists. Uh, I mean, you know, these are local enemies within England and that would be an external enemy. So it's a good point that perhaps had they won, we might not have, have had this kind of expansion of his theory as we see it here uh, in terms of toleration for non-Christians, at least in that. But yeah. Had they been a military danger, I think they would have been like the Catholics. You know, they would want to make good point. Yeah? Do we have any idea of the yeah. size of the Jewish and pagan and Muslim populations in the 1690s? In England? Mm -hmm. uh, there is evidence about the Jewish population. The first kind of arrival was 1655, a very, very small group of families. By the early 1661, there was a small synagogue, which we have a description of one person going and visiting it. But it remained a very small community. I mean, we're talking about, you know, under 500 people uh, in that respect. So maybe around 100 families that were there. Uh, the numbers will increase at the beginning of the 18th century. There'll be much more incoming numbers then. In terms of pagans, I, th I mean, he's definitely thinking in terms of the colonies, because that's where the missionary effort to convert in Carolina and you know all the I mean he was involved in that so you know he's looking at the pagans there in terms of Muslims I pretty sure there were other than visitors and ambassadors and you know emissaries you know there were non there were no native population there were also captives and they were in London uh, or in the port cities on the southern coast but these would be captives enslaved so basically either and we know a number of them were actually working, you know, serving in homes. But to what extent, you know, what their narrative is, what their story is, what happened to them. Uh, I only know of one who actually was captured for three years. He was actually the slave of uh, King James II, uh, before James became the king. And then he was released, and he went back to Morocco, and he becomes actually an ambassador. And so when he goes to visit France at the end of the 17th century, after James had fled to France, he goes and sees him, sit around, both of them start crying. Uh, but as I say, the evidence is 
I have not come in. I've looked all over the place, tried to find that kind of evidence. Early in the century, there may have been more because England, again, in terms of captives, England relied on captives because they wanted to exchange with captive, with British captives in North Africa. So we have names and lists of captives, you know, Muslim captives, Algerian, Tunisian, Moroccan, in England in 1620s, 1630s. Uh, but after that, I, you know, few names appear. I mean, I've looked at the records quite extensively. Very few names appear there. There are some here and there, but not a substantial number. But it's also interesting that King George the First had two Muslim uh, captive slaves in his, you know, in the palace, um, and people were making jokes about him because of that. Uh, so, you know, they'd be very, very few, and they would not have a social role because they would be enslaved. Uh, I think as far as acceptance goes, it's going to be indemnization. Uh, and that is the legal form of acceptance. Uh, there's nothing in Locke's letters, I mean, that's about all that one can rely on, to demonstrate that he had actually some kind of personal interaction with Muslims. If he did, it's not mentioned in the letters, and he wrote a huge amount of letters. In Holland, he must have met Jews because it kind of that's where the beginning of the idea of toleration hits him when he goes to Holland. Uh, but as I say, I mean he's dealing with the legal, with conceptualization of the state, and so it's not really accepting the other as other. Uh, but I think in so doing, I think he was really quite revolutionary. I mean nobody says that. Nobody at all says what he said in terms of, you know, even though he was forced by pros, but, you know, finally to say, you know, there is no logic, there is no law to say that the Muslim or the Jew or the pagan cannot be part of the commonwealth. In the same way that the Lutheran and the Presbyterian and the Quaker, and by that time all these had been accepted. I mean, that's the, you know, great, the, the revolution of 1688. Nobody says that. And that's where... I think a lot of critics who write about Locke and try to compare him with other theoreticians, including the quotation I made from uh, Jonathan Katz, uh, you know, they often compare him you know, with, with, with Pierre Bayle, the French tolerations, and they say Bayle had a wider view. Yes, Bayle had a wider view of toleration, but it did not include the non-Christians. I mean, all the debate throughout the century, as far as I can see, was about intra-Christian acceptance. And in his case, he moves beyond that. So, but yeah, I doubt about acceptance as such. <laughs> yeah? I mean, what seems to be this, this impressive uh, tolerance you know, for its time, uh, does it have to do maybe with the fact that at that point, uh, the race was not yet a political marker that could be connected to religion? Ooh, that's a big one. <laughs> uh, don't for, I mean, I don't know how that would have been handled in the case of pagans, because that's where you might have had the race issue in terms of Native Americans who were distinctly different, or Sub-Saharan Africans. With Muslims, if they are Turks, they're white. I mean, so there's no racism. And with the Jews as well. I mean, we're looking, well, they're Safai. I mean, they're basically from, from Spain. So, I mean, you know, it's Europe, you know. So, the, the difference is not going to be that striking in terms of visual impact. Uh, but it never comes out as a racial issue there. I mean, in terms of Moors, I mean, and then you get all these categories, Sturs and Moors and whatever, Mohammedan, etc. When, you know, when, when English writers and playwrights are kind of describing North African, you know, we call them Moors, uh, then you get race, but you don't get religion. I mean, they, you know, they ignore the fact of religion, but you get race, and you get kind of, you know, plays in which the Moor is really sub-Saharan, I mean, basically Negro in, in features, and they're exaggerating that, you know, as from Shakespeare's time on. I mean, they and that's kind of unfortunate Shakespeare's legacy. He makes the Moor Negro, and it never changes. But it's not religion. You find very little 
either because the playwrights themselves didn't know much about Islam, and so unless they can, you know, sometimes throw in an Allah or you know some kind of word, but they're really into they're more kind of aware of visual. Uh, Locke is not. I mean, he doesn't bring at all the issue of race. Um, mm -hmm. It's simply a matter of, as I say, logic. I mean, he finds himself, I don't know, I mean, I don't like to say that, but he found himself trapped by his logic against Prost. And the more that the guy pushed him, the more he had to go on and on towards the logical conclusion there's no reason whatsoever that we can deny them uh, the rights of the common people. So, I mean, we're really looking at a, a process of thinking that is more interested in theorizing politics uh, then uh, probably coming also from what seemed to be at that point more of a neutral uh, representation of the other, the East in general, which would become very different with the with Orientalism, with, you know, with, with I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. And so we're really, we're really looking at a completely uh, a, a, an area where maybe the knowledge seems to be more neutral about the East and therefore the incorporation of them, their rights and so on, within, uh, within the Anglican hierarchy uh, seems to make a lot of sense, but also an indication of a mentality that is, that is advanced. Uh, yes, in his case, as I say, I mean, uh nothing happens. I mean, it just remains, uh, you know, a theory on paper. And uh, Muslims will only be accepted in the 19th century in England as subjects of the crown. And that's not because, I mean, that's because of the empire to start off with, but also because of uh, Britons who go to India and convert and come back. And I mean, the first mosque is established by a British Indian. So, uh, a British uh, who goes to India and comes back. Uh, and then, you know, obviously with the migration from subcontinent, etc. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, this is, that's why I say, I mean, he, he is revolutionary the way he thinks, uh, and he's willing to put that on paper and to defend it to the limit, and he does. And as I say, by the end of it, you know, Prost has nothing to say. I mean, you know, uh, but in terms of Orientalism, yeah, you have to wait a bit longer. I mean, this is not yet the phase uh, where the English feel so superior. They are in terms of military capability, but not yet in terms of ideological capability. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Somebody wants to talk? Yeah. <laughs> um, why did Cromwell reintroduce Jews to England? They, they've been gone for three and a half centuries. Did, did the Jews do something for him, or what, what was the cause of that? Uh, basically, there are two kind of issues. One was financial, one was millenarian, theological. The theological is, you know, in the mid-1650s, there was an enormous uh, anticipation of the end of the world. The world had been created in 1656 BC, and therefore it will end in 1656 AD. And certain trends in Protestant theology had kind of begun, had been doing that since the end of the 16th century, were saying that, you know, the, the end, the eschaton, would not occur until the conversion of the Jews. You have that in famous poem where Andrew Marvel, you know. Uh, so there is that side to it. And when uh, the Jewish rabbi from Amsterdam, uh, Manasseh bin Israel, goes to England, I mean, he promotes that, that. You know, I mean, he kind of indirectly, you know, says this is a reason for accepting it. At the same time, there was financial investment there. I mean, 16, mid 1650s were very bad for England, and Cromwell was, you know had become a kind of law protector, a kind of supreme autocrat. So he wanted support from uh, you know, other sectors than his own. So there is that role of the financial, but on the larger scale there was the theological issue. But even that was not widely acceptable. I mean, there, you know, once Manasseh comes in and he starts writing, you find refutations, people who were not happy with what he was writing. So these would be the two reasons, basically, for the readmission of the Jews. Well, this has been really okay. wonderful. Thank you so much. That's it. Okay. <laughs> okay. We do have a reception um, in honor 
of Professor Nabil downstairs in room 135. So if you take that, if you go out this door, you take the elevator down a level. If you go out that door, you can follow the steps down. In room 135, please join us for our reception. Uh, everybody's very welcome. Thank you. Jews and Muslims. Absolutely. Yeah, pagans, anyone. <laughs> Even the atheists. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm an amateur. Right.